mine Bad bitches, every city in my tribe uh, look, 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 look behind Booty dominate the world, peaches ripe Is it disgusting that I've had multiple partners? Again, there's nothing wrong with having multiple partners. There's something wrong with sleeping with multiple people. Well, how is that different? Having multiple partners or sleeping with multiple people, that's the same thing. You don't have to sleep with your partner. What? You don't have to sleep with your partner. You said it's different sleeping with multiple people than said, it is I, having multiple partners, I, yes, which is the it. same thing. No, it's not. Why is it the same thing? What is, the, what is it that delineates? A partner, a partner as in a boyfriend or girlfriend. Someone who okay. someone who you're dating. So so what is the disgusting aspect? Can you pinpoint pinpoint that for me? That you've had that no, I can't say that. It just uh it's disgusting, you know? Okay, so you don't have a reason. Great. I do have a reason. I'm, not, I'm telling you my reason. <laughs> you don't have a reason. You don't actually have any logical thought within it. <clears throat> you're like it is what because kind of, it is. <laughs> like, okay, what, what so I get person, it. Well, we can move kind, on now. What kind of person well, hold on, hold on. What kind of person would you rather uh, drink from a used Coca-Cola can than open up a new one, you know? Nobody. So when it comes to drinking out of a different person's glass, would you argue that statistically or not statistically, there is a likelihood that there will be saliva yeah. left by the first person? Sure, yeah. So when it comes to intercourse, what do you think will be left by past people that would affect you? Uh, still emotions hanging on. So that can be true whether you have a high body count or not. Yeah, yeah I agree. But still this So way. again, let, let's make your analogy, let's make your analogy work here. What is left over from a high body count that would be equivalent to saliva? I don't know. Okay, great. So I think that's over two. Net, where, where do you want to go next? Over two, you think you're winning? What kind of, did, um, did, I, I didn't did, say did, I was did, winning, did, but you definitely did, have given me two know, claims that you can't substantiate or have any actual did, reasoning, you know, logic, man, or deduction you know, behind. Any man one second, work? one second. Let me let me explain why okay, I said that's over telling, two. Do you know any man that? No, no, no. Okay, no, no, no. I understand. I understand. But do you know any man that wants to? Watch you know what? If you can't respect, Nobody. one second, You're if you can't playful. respect simple playful. rules of engagement, whereas when you ask me a question, you give me the space to answer that question. Okay, I'm just telling you. Okay? Mm. okay, pumpkin? Tell me you acknowledge that. Tell me you understand. I, I acknowledge that, pumpkin. Great. Now you Are may you continue. Talk? Are you going to talk or no? You just mean. Um, so listening would be a, another really great quality to have um you may talk now what where, where would you like to go next uh all right no that's that's all i had to say okay you have a great day now thank you you too thank you Hello, welcome. Hi, how's it going? Good, how are you? I'm doing just dandy. That's great to hear. What's your take? Well, I've just noticed that a lot of a lot of these debates, the talking points, the premise behind all of them seem to be focused on I'd like to say a victimhood mentality. Because, like, for instance, it's, it's the talking points specifically are kind of all based in political propaganda and narratives. And you, you have both extremes. You have the modern feminist version of it on the side of the coin, and then you have the extreme red pill version of it side of the coin. And they're basically two halves of the same coin. They're, they're both extremes. They're both coming from a place of victimhood. They're both coming from a place of blaming the other for something that they don't want to take accountability within themselves. And I just don't see us being can bring a conducive environment for dating to uh, exist again in a healthy manner between men and women as long as both sides are in this place of, well, I want to say per well, perpetual victimhood, I think, is 
an accurate description, but essentially both sides promote um, people that follow their beliefs to allow the propaganda to galvanize them to justify staying in their unhealed trauma and wounds rather than to doing the inner work to to realize what are the parts of them that they uh, need to heal. Okay. So what are feminists not taking responsibility for? Well, I, I wouldn't say it's specifically feminists. I think it's, it's promoted in society. In this example, I, I think that most political ideological mo movements preach one thing and then do another and don't want to take accountability that they contradict their premise. So, so where is the accountability here? Can you answer that? Well, <clears throat> so I think in this example, um, the fact that it's everything is kind of focused on glorifying and glamorizing bad decisions and then saying that somebody else's fault for our decisions. Can you be specific what bad decisions that it's? Well, yeah. So like we'll, we'll use the body count for an example. Um, sure. I, I think it's been normal. To, it's been normalized and glorified to teach modern women that they need or they need to glorify and glamorize their bad decisions. But and it's no different. Men, it's been to, taught to men to do the same thing. And I think when either is being wait, taught wait, to. Wait, wait, one second, one second. Can what I please makes, my thought? Um, I, I, I just want to, because I've let you pretty go on quite a bit. Um, so I just want to make sure that we stay on point here. Um, what is exactly the bad decision? Well, gen generally bad decisions are things that have consequences that we don't like. Uh, I think that's too much of an oversimplification. Uh, would you say, like, if I went hiking, that there is a risk that during my hike I could be injured? I think if you want to simplify and try to quantify it down to something like that, that's not what I'm saying. I think then using outside analysis, I don't really get well, what I'm trying to say. So I'd be happy I, to clarify if we're miscommunicating. Yeah, I, I just want to make sure that, you know, right there, you would agree that if I do become injured, even though that is an undesirable outcome, it wouldn't be the hiking that is the bad, that is a bad choice, well, I, right? I think, I think you're, again, you're, you're taking something that doesn't really apply to what I'm saying. So I can, okay, I'm happy to clarify. Maybe you can put a little bit more context in it. Sure, sure. So, you know, the, like with the body count thing, see, here's the thing. Most people who claim that body count doesn't matter eventually want somebody who wants to, have, they eventually would like to, not all the time, but more times not, they eventually want a life partner. So when men or women are out sleeping around, they've been taught to glorify and glamorize these things as liberating and free and, and empowering. But in reality, if they eventually want a life partner, those things would not be seen as liberating. It's, it's kind of like wanting your cake and eat it, too, because a lot of them don't want to take responsibility for the aftermath of what is usually um, seen in men and women that do uh, choose to act promiscuous and sleep around. So, uh, number one, I don't think that necessarily engaging with people in terms of like body count doesn't matter necessarily means that promiscuity is being promoted. Uh, number two, I don't know why if someone at one point in time is interested in casual relationships and has partner, uh, multiple partners throughout that time, that when they are interested in a committed long-term relationship, that um, somehow that specific time where they weren't interested would now influence their current time where they are interested. Certainly, certainly. I can, I'd be happy to clarify that. So the yeah, reason sure. why is because how someone conducts themselves when they're single is going to be a mere representation of how they conduct themselves when they're in a relationship. Uh, no, I, I, how, how is that synonymous? No. <laughs> I would well, argue that about, lots of people speak, one, one, second, them. one second, one second, I would argue that majority of people when they are single act differently than when they are in a relationship. Well, I, I think I think that really depends on their level of integrity and accountability and personal self reflection upon themselves. I think you're letting people off the hook a little too easy. 
No, like, for example, if I am single and I'm interested in meeting people, I might do more social activities like uh, going out with my friends, uh, maybe joining a book club, doing mm-hmm. all these things so I can just meet people. And then maybe when I do, one second, one second. And then when I do meet someone that I uh, find to be uh, compatible for a long term committed relationship, I might end up just doing other things things with them rather than continuing that social interaction aspect you're you're trying to use outside things and making metaphors or or analogies for something that you know we're talking about specifically about one topic so i'm talking about examples there is one example where someone would act differently being single than they would act differently when they're in a relationship and that's how they socialize so that would defeat your premise overall if we no. are going, if you want like a personal example that involves sex in college, I wasn't really interested in a long term committed relationship because I had a high course load. Yet when I did have time um, outside of that, I did engage in casual relationships. And then once I graduated okay. college and got into the work industry, I was more interested in long term okay. committed relationships. Well, so then I oh, so that I met to, to someone and well, I don't wait one second. When I'm talking, <laughs> it is not your turn to talk. Okay. So I, the only way I feel Great. like this let me conversation... let me finish my point. So oh, okay. um, again, at that time uh i was able i I was interested in that and my uh experience in college didn't make it so i wasn't able to engage Mm -hmm. in a long-term committed relationship my needs desires and interests changed all right so i i think what's happening is that if you want to set a ground rules of of respecting each other's perspective there's nothing wrong with that but if you're going to take what I'm saying and try to manipulate it to redirect it to make it be about something else when you know specifically about what I'm saying and I'm trying to bring you on point and you're going to be passive aggressive and do that whole talking down matter and I'm just holding you accountable of being consistent to you know what I'm talking about specifically. So using outside analogies that have no relation to whatsoever on what I'm speaking of, then I just feel like it's manipulating the conversation and you don't really want to actually have a respectfully to our dialogue. So I'm going to try again and we'll see if we can go about this a little Wait, bit different. Let me respond to that let me respond to that number one I, I, number I, I one i'm not being you. passive aggressive if you would prefer i would be fucking aggressive i can do that number okay. two you are saying such vague statements without any uh-huh. context that when i give an analogy to show that your vagueness does not apply that's oh, okay. when you get mad and number three okay. how interesting for someone to come up here and say everyone's just being a victim and then proceed to act like a victim I so it's okay so but here's the thing though um my point being is you're proved making my point for me so what i'm saying is that a lot of times when people are in this victim mentality they cannot take any self-reflection when someone's applying saying hey you're not conducting yourself in the manner of what you're expecting the other person to and instead of self-reflecting and actually trying to apply it you deflect back to what they're doing to avoid looking at yourself so the whole point is that I can simply make an observation saying it doesn't feel like you're being conducive to what you're expecting somebody else to. Mm-hmm. And so when I'm just making that observation, you could just try to pull, take it. And it's like, well, I'm not trying to do that, but I appreciate I that's what you're interpreting. And let's go. Could you please let me finish? Okay. No, I will not. Let me finish. Please or remember, you please remember sir. Please remember. Please remember. I have given you your mic. Okay. The only reason that people will continue to hear your argumentation is because i allow it okay so understand the dynamic here that since i've given you your mic at any time i can take it away why don't we get back to the actual argument rather than you trying to justify your victimhood behavior what is your next talking point when it comes to body count all right so basically my interpretation is you don't want to be held accountable of yourself but you want to hold somebody else to so it's all good it's all good that's why these conversations why the victim mentality is because you can only look at it through a lens where somebody else is wrong if they're pointing what? out your, your wait bullshit. what so, expectations am i having of someone what without, expectations without, without am i having of someone triggered? related to my actions you can't get not get triggered and get all up up in your feelings just triggered. because someone's making an observation without simply trying to understand it. No, and then I, you do I'm the very triggered. thing. Please let, let me finish my thought. Three. If you're not no, triggered, no, you can no, let me finish no, no. my thought, please. No. Okay. 
another another piece of advice here you do not get paid per word okay i have let you monologue <laughs> because i do want to give this space to speak but your continuation of just kind of going off you're doing this you're doing this you're doing this you're not doing this make the argument what is the argument i'm saying that if you can't deal with the energy you're putting out don't bitch when it comes back to you one tenth of what you're putting what it out what is your you, argument regarding no, body count I'm just i don't out care about your i don't care about your whining okay Before well then your guess mom, what? If you're upset then, what is your argumentation you regarding body count why your should bullshit. body okay. count matter all I'm trying to say is the very mentality that you're I in and people care. I, I, I'm I don't care. This to my point. You have one question so directed you for you. Or are you so what? triggered that you can't handle it? I'm, I'm not triggered, okay? Well, then why can't you my let me finish? Job, okay, no. My job within this live is to make sure that the conversation and the debate continues to go on. And you need me to manage you in that aspect i've asked you a very specific question why does body count matter any other response you give me at this point i'm going to drop you and i'm saying the very way of you're conducting yourself right now that you refuse to look at is okay. my exact point of why it does so it's okay look i okay i i thought i made myself very clear i thought i tried to communicate that we are here to debate and i specifically told you if the next thing that comes out of your mouth is anything but an argument why body count matters, then I'm going to drop. I wanted a debate. I really did. Sorry, I couldn't hang. Okay, um, I wanted to, can you hear me? Yep, I can hear you. So, what makes you pro-abortion? I consider healthcare or abortion to be healthcare, and I'm pro people having access to healthcare. Why is that? Uh, because I think it uh, resolves, well, why am I pro people having access to healthcare? Yeah, like pro-abortion, yeah. Uh, because people who get abortions see immediate health um, as well as mental positives. Okay. Well, I disagree with you. In what aspect? I'm against abortion. Why? I'm against it because it's 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 evil. You feel me? And there's a lot of. Why Why they, there's a lot of people that is unresponsible for what they do. How old are you? Hmm? How old are you? 20. What year are you born? 2003. I'm 20. I can show you my ID and all that. I'm 20. No, I'm, I'm fine. I just wanted to make sure that you were following TikTok TOS. Um, why is it evil? It's evil because of, at the end of the day, like if it is well i can say like from the background knowledge the person that came up with abortion she was a kkk leader she created what do you that mean came up with abortion i gotta search up the girl name but she is the starter of abortion and she had a specific purpose yeah, she had a what, what year was that? What mm -hmm. year did she come up with abortion? Uh, I'll be right back. I'm going to search it up real quick. Okay. <laughs> I think she thinks Margaret Sanger invented abortion. I don't know who she I just want her to say it. I said she 
she's the reason why there's a lot of these abortion clinics. Margaret Sanger? Oh. Is that the person? Okay. Um, just in case they don't know, we can't hear you when you go to the app. Well, what I meant is she's the reason why it's popular to, to this day. Is it she Margaret Sanger? No. Oh, who is it? Who is it? We can't hear you when you go to the app, by the way. She's going to look it up. She doesn't know. I don't know who it, who invented it, but the shit evil. Well, okay. If you can't give a, give a name, then you can't use that argumentation. It's evil. It's I, life, you, 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 said that, you said that, but you haven't answered why. Right. She didn't invent it, but still, she's the reason why she? it exists. She pushed okay. it. Who's she? She came up with these Who's organizations, she? Planned Parenthood. Oh, so we've already, so you are... we've already established you need to be able to name a name. If you can't, then I don't know where you expect this to go. Think about it. What is an abortion? It is the deliberate termination of pregnancy. What's her name? So you feel like it's right. Or the person that popularized it or who like who are you talking about she she doesn't know um yes mm -hmm. i think if someone wants to deliberately terminate their pregnancy they have every right to do so that's wrong that's why like, it's just wrong okay like I, I really so i really do want to debate this but if you can't answer simple questions like we can't get anywhere shut up mark that's ricky but it's it's wrong because that's human life. Man, you can't just way, oh fuck that way, lady. What is what, what hush, if your mama aborted you, punk? Hush, hush, hush. My bad. All right, all right. Sorry, he kind of he kind of killed it for you. Um, <laughs> um, I really, I, I mean, she said Planned Parenthood, so I'm assuming it was Margaret Sanger, but we know, but she doesn't like, know, like. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah, I can hear you. Uh, yeah, it was Margaret Sanger. I think she was talking about the woman did not invent abortion. Abortion has been around for, for millennia after millennia after millennia. Uh, are, you, okay. are you here to debate? I am in a unique situation when it comes to abortion. I personally don't agree with it, but I also don't think it is my right to tell the woman what to do with her body. I mean, okay. we, okay. Can we don't have a disagreement. Okay. Like I said, I don't believe it's my right to tell a woman what to do with her body. She, if she wants to do with it, do that. She can, that's her choice. Okay. That, that, that's completely her choice. I mean, telling somebody something that so, you, so you're not think, here to debate. I'm just saying, I, I, I'm just I, saying, I know you're just saying, but I, I am here to debate. And so I'm asking you if that's what you're here for. I just have some questions based off of some of your content. That's okay. just uh, okay. are some of the things. Uh, what do you consider a high body count, first of all? Because you, well, I heard I, I got. I don't on... have any premise to high body count. Okay, because I think it's subjective, and anything that we decide is arbitrary. Yeah, because uh, yeah, I, I mean, I agree with a lot of the things that you were saying. You know, I, I yeah, I guess I would say I'm not here to to debate. I, I'm here to just. I just saw some of this stuff, and I was like, hey, this. I had some questions. That was all okay. it was. But, you know, I do apologize for interrupting your debate if that that's what I am, in fact, doing, I guess. Uh, no but, worries. Yeah, I, mean, I hope you have it, a great afternoon. You too. Bye -bye. Um, Margaret Sanger was pro-life, and that's all I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> Anytime Margaret Sanger comes up, I swear, within one second, bells and requests. <laughs> it's just like, mm -hmm. oh my gosh, there's so much misinformation. Mm -hmm. Welcome. She invented the kite. Hi, kite. Sorry, I don't know if this works. I don't know if anybody can hear me. I can hear you. Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. Uh, sorry, I hit the request button and I forgot to hit cancel request when somebody was in here. Sorry, I have a little one in the background. I'm so sorry. Um, when she was talking about how abortion is mean and evil and it's just ridiculous, people should have their own choice. Um, I did have a question, though, because I'm reading the top of your thing. I'm just now joining uh, within, like, the last few minutes. What is it that you're talking about with the purity culture? 
Um, so essentially that purity culture is present in modern day and that it is harmful. Okay. What part of purity culture? Are we talking the religious aspect or are we talking uh, just people? Not, or are we talking like when you go to the Middle East and women aren't allowed to wear what they want? I think any notion that relates to someone's body being pure by abstaining. So is your stance that women should be able to choose whether or not they want the purity or? I don't think purity exists. I don't think that you have any purity if you are uh, a virgin. I don't think if you, you lose any purity if you have sex. That I can agree with. Sorry, I didn't. I, I didn't want to. I didn't have anything to debate, so I don't want to make it seem mean. I actually agree with a lot of the things that you're talking about. <laughs> so I'm just. I don't want to like mess up the debate. So I'm gonna go ahead and let you go. <laughs> no worries. Thank you so much. Hello. Hello, welcome. Uh, I'd say I'd agree with most things. The thing I may disagree, but I might need to hear more of your context from it, is feminism is still needed, but I guess it depends on your definition of feminism and which country you're from. Uh, so I would say feminism is the uh, to free someone from oppression, exploitation, or discrimination on the basis of gender. Yeah, but couldn't that definition fit under like egalitarianism or like humanism? Like, why do you use the feminism movement in your definition? Because uh, I think intersectional feminism encompass encompasses it more. Um, and I think if you uh, want to even get more specific, it would be um, also like a critique of the patriarchy as well as like other systems in place. Okay, I'm not from America, I'm from Australia, from my accent. Uh, what in American society do you think is the biggest inequality between the genders? Um, I would say medical misogyny. I would also or, uh, argue social constructions, um, which lead to unequal outcomes when it comes to uh, politics, economic, as well as uh, under capitalism. Yeah, Can I you elaborate on medical well, misogyny? Um, I would say, I would just say as well, just because like we may be feminists like in North America, that doesn't mean that we don't still advocate for like women that are marginalized in countries that aren't in North America. Because I know you said like it depends on what country you're from, but I don't think that's true. Well, every country would have a different amount of r rights for and against certain genders. So I'd say the we country does matter. We don't think it ought to. Yeah, that, that's a different point. <laughs> uh, so can you elaborate on medical misogyny? Uh, yeah, so I would argue that women often face misdiagnosis or negative outcomes when it comes to engaging in the healthcare. Uh, if you want an example, when it comes to like prescription drugs, women are typically excluded from uh, studies on prescription drugs because they think the menstrual cycle will essentially make the, uh, the data skewed. Uh, so because they are typically tested on men, uh, when they do hit the market, the dosage and frequency is based on a man's body, not a woman's. And so women often, uh, when taking the prescription, um, can essentially take too much. But isn't that a problem with uh, studies and potentially doctors and not necessarily with like the government? Because you're saying like patriarchy, what does patriarchy got to do with like medicine? Uh, if it's looked through from a patriarchal lens, patriarchy just doesn't mean a system of government because I would argue there's also uh, social aspects of patriarchy. Like, would you say like the women doctors are doing the same thing or is this just uh, masculine doctors? It's the in system America? in general, the system in general. Uh, but if you want me to answer that question specifically, typically women do have better outcomes when the doctor is female. 
All right, that's that's good to hear. Again, I'm studying UK mid, and it's a very different system. And uh, women's health has its own section, basically. Um, I'd like to ask, uh, can you elaborate on the grape culture thing? Because that's, I know, very specific to America. Sometimes I say study specific for colleges as a college grape culture. So what do you mean by grape culture? Um, it's where women perceive a continuum of threatened violence that ranges from sexual marks to sexual touching to grape itself. It condones physical and emotional terrorism against women and presents it as a norm. So would you say you think there's a widespread grape culture in America or is it localized to places such as colleges? I, I would say within America uh, that women uh, have specific behaviors and understandings of how they experience the world to try and prevent them from being a victim of grape. Uh, what's the grape statistics like in America or oh, North America, sorry? Um, one in five women will be the victim of attempted or completed grape. Is that sexual assault or actual grape? I said attempted or completed grape. Because like when I looked at these statistics years ago, I don't know if it's changed. It was much lower than one in five if you're talking about uh, grape, grape and not like sexual assault or sexual harassment. Do you have a source I can see? I'll look at it up on my computer so I'm not giving uh, bad numbers. Great. I could be wrong, but I think it was like one in three for sexual assault. And then, well, I know sexual assault is definitely a lot higher because sexual assault has to, in, you know, includes that, includes grape and among other things. So I'm trying to access the FBI stats, but it's very annoying <laughs> to access. It's very, it's very ugly. <laughs> Looks Do like you something have from the eighties. Point that you want to make while you're looking that up. Um, because I know there's a lot of misinformation on the statistics. Some are specific to colleges and not women in general or society in general. And I've heard very different. I've heard one in three, one in five, one in six, one in twelve. It it can't be all of those. If you've heard these, based on your research, what have you found? I found that, again, most of the numbers that are very high either are sexual assault and not just singling on grape, or they're very localized to certain colleges, which is why I asked you whether it was widespread. That's not what I asked. That's not what I asked. Since you oh, seem to have had this discussion more than once with several people, wouldn't you want to know the, the actual number? Yeah. So I'm asking you, since you have had this discussion, what is the actual number? I think it was like less than 2%. It was like some, it's by thousands. It's what? Uh, again, it might be different in America, but it was much, much less than one in five. Well, what was it? Well, okay, so I'm on Statistica right now. You can tell me if this is a bad source for America. It said uh, 40 per 100,000 inhabitants, and this was in 2013. I'm sorry, what is the title of the source? Uh, it was just the first thing. It's from uh, Statistica. You can tell me if this is a bad source in America. Uh, what, what is the title? Uh, reported forcible grape rates in the United States from 1990 to 2022. Yeah, I don't think reporting would be a good statistic to go off of because a lot of like the majority of people don't report. Um, if you were to go to rain.org, it, it says that one in six women would be the victim of uh, completed or attempted grape in their lifetime. Well, I do agree with you that there would be a number of unreported, but because they're unreported, we can't just increase the number. Oh, yeah, like we have to we work with like, what we have. 
No, we can actually just get these statistics outside of like formal measures such as like policing and actually like speak to women themselves because a lot of women uh, don't report. And so we can actually like run surveys of women rather than going to like the police to be like, oh, how many reports do you get? Because that would not get you a very good number. So can you tell me the one in six one so I can have a look at it? Rain.org. Yeah, and this also doesn't break it down by gender, too. Um, yeah, of course, Carnell, there's a lot of sexual assaults in uh, prison. Yeah, I don't know if those would be reported. Probably not. Because <laughs> usually it has to be like a legal case, and you can't really make a legal case if it's in prison. Well, even um, if you, you want to go uh, based off rain again, out of uh, 1,000 grapes, only around 350 are reported to the police. Um, and then 50 lead to arrests. And then typically we see about 25 to 28 who actually are incarcerated. So I think that is a really um, important analysis to take in, especially the non reporting, as well as when it is reported, the success it comes to actual prosecution and arrests, which I think can be a huge deterrent from people not reporting. Obviously, I agree with you on that. Not there's a lot of rapists walking free. Um, I'm looking at rain right now. It's saying uh, victims of sexual violence, uh, rape, and sexual assault. I think it includes sexual assaults as well. Uh, no, here. Um, if you, I can just make it my background one second. So um, I feel this is um, essentially an argument so, to minimize. Yeah, if you find this graphic right here, that's what says that grape. If yeah, you find I'm, this I'm, graphic, I'm, this graphic specifically says grape. You can scroll down to find that one, I'm sure, somewhere on the website you're looking. Yep, it's further down. But like, if you look at the numbers they gave at the top, it would uh, be I have a, a question. Less. I have a question, Mediduck. Why are you so insistent on trying to like prove that it's less? What is the point? Uh, because I think it's fear mongering when you say uh, to like a woman, "There's a one in six chance you're gonna get raped." That's extremely scary. He's well, just no. saying it's not that bad. Yeah. Well, what what if it's the truth though? But like, you have to prove that. I did. In on the exact same thing on rain.org, it says there's 400,000 victims per year of rape and sexual assault in the United States. Yeah, it's not one in six per year, it's in their lifetime. We already said that. And where are they getting their sources from? Because right under that, it says campus sexual violence. Yeah, it's, it's saying that they. It, it, it says right under that graphic as well that they have a, a higher risk when they're on university campuses, um, but that one in six is not specifically at specific to university campuses. All right, fair enough. Yeah, even the, um, even the source, if we were to take statistica.com as a valuable source, even if they say grape in the United States, um, it says, since grape and sexual assault continue to be underreported in the United States, it's important to find a solution for this devastating problem. And I think it's very, like, a part of the problem when you kind of say it, it's not that bad. It really minimizes how many people um experience especially femme presenting people experience the world i'll say that's not necessarily true just because mm -hmm. you so um i recently took up running and yeah. um for those of you that don't know in montana uh, especially during the winter it gets dark very early um the earliest we typically see it to get dark is between 4 30 and 5. and so i bought um this uh, essentially it's kind of like a, a vest 
that uh, has a light on it and is also reflective so that if I'm running in the dark, cars can see me. I did not buy a pink one. I bought a green one so that people didn't know I was a woman running alone at night. Do you think that that is um, like a fair analysis and choice that I made? You're keeping your safety as a high priority. I think that's, you know, obviously it's not fair to you, but it's very difficult in society to keep everyone safe. Like I take I mean, safety precautions as a guy. Bad. If it's not that bad, then you should say, no, you should buy a pink one. It's not that bad. You shouldn't be worried. Personally, about I disagree. Wearing I take a, a feminine color, and... thinking that a stranger will be like, wow, there's a woman jogging alone at night. Um, I take, as a guy, I'm like six foot, I do jujitsu, I take safety precautions and my uh, statistics of getting uh, attacked or robbed is probably less than one in six and I take the same precautions. So me personally. Um, really? Would like, you, would you not buy blue? I, I wear and do things that would like not him I'm, I'm just, I, I know, I, I know, I get, I get your point. I'm just asking you, would you not buy blue? Blue for what, like a vest? Yeah, just to see if, you know, so people could see you running at night. Would you not buy blue that indicates that is like a gendered color that you are a man? Would do you think that people knowing you are a man running alone at night makes you any, any, uh, makes you more unsafe? Well, to me, being alone at night is unsafe in general. Again, I'm I'm a guy. I've been in bad situations. I try to take precautions. Sure. So, if they were to see just the singular vest, they know that I that I'm alone. Do you think them knowing that you are a man or a woman alone would the man be more unsafe or would the woman be more unsafe? They'll be, both be unsafe for different reasons. What 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 are the different reasons? Um, the man's probably more likely to get attacked. The woman's more likely to get raped. That's what the statistics show. Okay. So you would argue that women have a higher awareness when it comes to their sexual assault, to, to being sexually assaulted. Then I think that yes. you just acknowledge that how women experience the world is based on their gender. The danger is yes. based on their gender. Great. Yes, that's not in disagreement. Uh, but that doesn't necessarily mean there's a whole culture around it. Again, I could get attacked by a guy. Statistically, it's unlikely. I'm not going to say there's a culture of... It's not based uh, on your gender, though. And it is based on our gender, which makes it a gender-based crime. Mostly, yes. And it is also a crime that is socially acceptable. If you want to um, talk about the different instances... We certainly can, like within especially American culture, uh, abusers are empathized with and victims are vilified. Yep, yeah, obviously I'll, I'll disagree with that very well, plainly. But that is the reality. That, that is the reality. I would disagree. I don't think widespread it is. In certain areas, probably. But I'd say widespread. In certain if... areas? the areas you're t talking about. I don't know if you're talking about like the justice system, the way that they don't want to prosecute people and such, those type well, of areas. You, you made the delineation. So I'm asking you what areas? Uh, I'll say like the average person would not say rape is okay. I think majority of people, high majority would say it's not acceptable, which is why I'd say there's no culture around it because most people are not pro-rape or grape, grape, grape. See, I disagree because we can look at kind of the um, cultural thing of victim blaming, uh, where women are often asked when they are the victim of sexual assault or grape, what were you wearing? Were you drinking? Did you give any mixed signals? Is this someone you're romantically interested in? As if it is our behavior that made it so we were graped. Again, I don't know how widespread that is. I, I know those things are being said. I'm not doubting that uh, at all. But again, I think if you ask 
any person on the street is grape okay they'll say no if you ask them a yes or no question they'll so say that's no. not the marker that's not the marker just asking if people say grape is okay because we can even see studies to where men admit, admit to either sexual coercion or forcible in, uh, forcible intercourse when grape is not used as a specific term when just the act of grape is described without using that word and then as soon as you use that word then they then they say no i don't do that so would you say America is pro-grape? I would say the culture within America um, supports grape as a normalized concept. That it will, it, it is going to exist. Well, it's going to exist is different to uh, like being pro. Uh, just so, so I already read you the definition of grape culture, um, which is women perceive a continuum of threat and violence that rages from sexual remarks to sexual touching to grape itself. It condones oh. physical, uh, physical and emotional terrorism against women and presents it as a norm. If you want other examples of that, I would say that uh, things like catcalling or uh, even grape itself are much a part of male bonding. Perhaps I had a different definition of like, well, grape culture is perhaps in like the definition you said, it might be more accurate to America. Like when I, when I hear the word culture, I guess I think of something a lot more uh, widespread, but I guess in the definition you gave, perhaps that's got more merit to it. So that could just be uh, my bad. Okay. Did you have anything else? Uh, can you elaborate on what like, just body count means? Is like just two words that can mean a lot of things. Uh, so body count, like the vagueness of definition, I would say is just how many sexual partners someone has, has had. But like it is pro or against or like, what's um, the goal well, the number, one, on I, number one, I don't think there's like an actual definition that we can apply. Uh, and number two, um, I don't think it's relevant in terms of uh, engaging with someone if you're interested in a hookup or long-term committed relationship. Like, I'd say if, from my point of view, it's all case by case basis. Some people find that very important. Some people don't find it important. I don't think it's up to us to tell them you should think this is important or you should think this is not important. Well, I haven't heard a good argument why it's important. Well, I know some people come from like religious backgrounds where you're not even supposed to have any body count. I don't think example. religion is a good argument to justify to justify it because we can see that religion has condoned a lot of really harmful things uh, I'm, I'm aware i'm agnostic i'm not religious i'm just saying that if that's their preference like who are we to say to them that you're not allowed to have that preference um if someone has a preference that is rooted in racism do you think we should have that same kind of energy like who are we to say that you can't be racist uh, I'll tell you that's a very different context, but even if someone is racist, you can't really stop them <laughs> from like, if they're not dating a certain race due to racism, like you can't really stop that, even if it's not very nice. <laughs> um, that's not my question though. Essentially you're saying you shouldn't push back on someone's preferences, even if you think they're harmful. So I'm giving you an example on someone's preference yeah. to be racist which I would consider harmful and saying yeah, is your argument is that you harmful, should not uh, that. I would say body count would, like why does body count have to be harmful? Because uh, I think when it comes to saying that body count um, matters, you are uh, dehumanizing and stereotyping someone. No, but I feel like you can do that about anything. You can stereotype anything that you see as a preference. Well, I disagree with you that body count is a preference. I think it's philosophy. Philosophy can be part of preferences. So if we're going to talk about a preference, um, like I think I prefer brunettes over blondes. Um, I can't tell you why, but I'm not saying that brunettes are superior and that anyone who dates a blonde uh, will not have a long-lasting committed relationship. They will be abused. 
you're dating a loser. I'm not some like brunette supremacist. But when people do have body count, quote unquote, preferences, that's exactly what they're saying, that um, she won't be a good wife, uh, she won't be loyal. They, they are saying that if you do have multiple partners, you are less of a human. Which yep. again know, is why I, I think people it's a are, I know some it's people are saying philosophy. that. Hmm? Uh, yeah, but I know some people are saying that, but not everyone is thinking like that. Then what is the preference? Uh, well, I can give you me, for example. I would like someone that has a similar body count to me. I don't why? want someone. Uh, I think it would help with compatibility. And I think there is some. Yeah, I'd say with just compatibility. In what aspect? Uh, because I I have like I'd say a low or medium body count. It's not nothing. It's not fifty. Uh, I'd say I'd have more in common with someone that has a similar body count. If someone why, has why a, does body count relate to compatibility? Um, because there's definitely usually a lot of connotations if someone has a very high or very low. Body can usually there's a reason. Um, it, what do you mean by that? What what type of reason? Well, uh, I think the easy example is, the, uh, at least in like my community, the people that have a very low to no body count are typically very religious, and I'm not a very religious person. Ah, uh, well, then it's not the body count because would you date someone with a lower body count who was not religious? Well, again, I prefer that I'd have a similar body count that's to me. That's a yes or no. Would you date someone with a lower body count that's not religious? Potentially, yeah. So it's not the body count? But I would say that typically there's like connotations. I don't know why some people are saying insecure. It's gone. I, I disagree. Like, um, uh, again, it's not the body count. It's the aspects of comp compatibility. And I um, would disagree with you that uh, I had, I, I, again, I don't know my body count. But if I say that it's like around 30, which is what I think it is, um, then I had three times the body count that my uh, husband did when we got married or when we even got together and uh, most compatible person I've ever been with. Yeah, but like that's with you personally. So that fits your preference. Right, but you would have to, uh, it wasn't a, I didn't even know his body count until recently. Um, you would have to establish like why, because <laughs> because that goes against your premise that there is compatibility within body count. You would have to establish that there is. I'd say there can be compatibility with basically anything. But you're, you're saying that they're correlated, and I don't think you can make that argument. I'd say stereotypically they, they do. You're just saying that. You're not actually providing any argumentation or data. Well, I don't think there's any major studies on this, is there? There's no like meta-analysis on people with... Right. So again, account. you're just saying it does. You're not actually providing any argumentation or data. Well, like, would you disagree that there's not like behavioral patterns? Uh, no. Because so. I, I mean, sorry. Yes, I I do disagree. Because like I feel like that, like you know, that most people that are like virgins at a higher age are typically very religious. I'll say that's a very clear thing that I see day to day and online. Like that's a clear um, pattern. Sure, sure. But there are people who are virgins who are not religious. And yes, again, it's not, it's not the body so. count. Wait, it's not the body count. It's the religion. Yes, but I'm saying in general, like that's a pattern. And you just said yes. Did you not? Sure, into? sure. Yes, I would agree that there are religious people who have low body counts. I would also argue there are religious people who have high body counts. Yes, there are. <laughs> but it's not the body count that is the issue. It is the religious that you actually have the preference for. In that specific example, yeah. And I think if you go on the other I end, if someone's having 300, 400 plus, uh, that, that could be a different issue 
Um, I disagree. W would you sleep with Angelina Jolie? No. Why not? You don't find her attractive? She's probably too old for me. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I don't know how old you are. Um, um, is there a celebrity that you would sleep with? Um, no, um, I have a partner. I wouldn't sleep with anyone else. <laughs> just, just hypothetically, if you didn't have a partner, is there a celebrity you would sleep with? Um, probably not. Uh, I, I think I need to have that emotional connection. Like, I, I don't know any celebrities personally. But uh, that's me personally. I know that's, uh, so that's if you did, no, uh, okay, fine. I can change it. If you did meet someone that you had an emotional connection with and, uh, were compatible with, and then they disclosed that they had a 400 body count, even after you had sex, would you then dump them? I, I would have not had sex with them in the first place. <laughs> Probably not. What if they didn't know their body count? i uh, probably ask like just in general whether what if they said they, they weren't sure like they weren't comfortable giving a number um uh, then maybe we can get like std tests like okay. both of us beforehand then, if they got the std tests uh and if they're they, being they honest if they're being the honest with me and we're both clean then sure Great. uh if they're specifically then you just being dishonest, that body count didn't matter thing. Yeah, but if they didn't know and they're not disclosing it, that's dishonesty. That's that's a different that's a different problem. It's there. not dishonesty. I I don't think I have to disclose um like specifics of my last relationship. Yep. Uh, someone said STD test don't determine body count. I know that, but typically people with higher rates of sex have higher rates of STIs. That's there are studies on that. If you want to talk about this. I, I agree. Honest. Like, obviously, the more partners you have, the higher risk of STIs that you have. But anyone who is sexually active has a high risk of STIs. Yep. So if that is the concern, then obviously, I, I agree with you, you should get STI mm -hmm. testing. And if they do the test, and there is no STIs, then you just said body count really didn't matter. Yep. And I guess it would also matter whether they're having uh, protected or unprotective in the body count. Because if they're having like 400 unprotected, that's kind of showing that they're probably too adventurous for me. <laughs> like, I don't think I could handle someone like that. Well, number one, I don't know who goes home and like puts a tally in a notebook and then makes notes of like protected, unprotected. I don't know if they like take a lock of hair, a blood type, maybe give like a Yelp review or, you know, mail them a letter and terms of like things that they could uh, improve on. But I think within every context you have given me, you have shown that it's really not the body count. It's either you don't are compatible with the religious views, you are concerned with STIs. And once that is alleviated, it really doesn't matter. Yeah, but I think you're misinterpreting what I'm saying. I agree with you that it's not the literal body count. I'm saying there are certain patterns that you can see, which has to be discussed. Right. So it's not the body count. I agree with you because someone can have a uh, one relationship. Um, and let's say that relationship ended very poorly. And, uh, there was a lot of trauma that resulted from the, how our relationship ended. And, uh, that could be harmful when it comes to, uh, when you engage in, in a future relationship with them, but that's not to do with body count. Um, the same can be true if someone has 10 or 12 partners. There can be uh, traumatic experiences from that. It's not the body count. It's the trauma. Yep, I, I can agree with that. Great. Anything else? Uh, can you elaborate what K-12 means? I don't know if that's an American term for comprehensive sex. Kindergarten through grade 12. Ah, uh, okay. I think... Yeah, I think sex ed's pretty good. I'm, I'm, I'm in medicine, so we do a lot of sex ed. I think it's pretty good. And there are some uh, med students, uh, very smart people that don't know uh, some basics in uh, women's health. So I think that should be taught better. <laughs> oh, good. Yeah, I, I completely agree. That's, I'd say that's probably the best point you have there. And probably pro abortion. I'd say I'm pro abortion. Perfect. I'm glad we uh, came to some 
conclusions, some agreed upon conclusions. Okay, I think we agree on most things. It's probably minor semantics and we're also from different cultures. So um, there's also those contexts. I agree. Um, can I ask, what's your opinion on, a, like, well, I guess, what's your definition on toxic masculinity? Because I don't know, I guess, too much about that because most content I see are almost localized in America. Is, uh, characterized by the traits of stoicism, competitiveness, aggression, dominance, misogyny, and homophobia. Okay, fair enough. Um, other people probably want to have a go. I'd say we agree on most things and it's probably some very small minor details that we probably disagree on. Although yeah, apparently your cat completely disagrees with me, so that's it is what it is. Okay. I hope you have a great afternoon. Thank you. Eat that up, TBH. Okay. <laughs> Chat was so. Uh, well, okay, it's an hour. Yay! I'm, I'm glad to know we have, still have, and I'm almost done with my makeup. How exciting! Usually I get distracted. How <laughs> things? Hello. Hello. Welcome. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, you got a lot of background, background noise. My my connection was bad. You do have a lot of background noise. It's okay. Oh wait, hold on. Minimize that. <laughs> Uh, I guess while he's working out background noise, we'll do a, we'll do our show. Uh, if you are new here, I am a feminist content creator. If you like that kind of content, I highly recommend uh, you follow, like the live. Uh, you can also follow me on Instagram, YouTube, and join my Discord. Um, gifting and subscribing is always appreciated. If you want to support me additionally outside of TikTok gifts or subscriptions, I do have Cash App and Venmo in bio. And I also do have my Amazon book list. Um, which if you want to send me a present is like the key to my heart. Uh, it's related to all of these topics. So uh, if you send me more literature so I can make better argumentation, uh, it's a win-win for both of us. We have the, the educational, entertaining content. And I think that's it. Are you there, Ty? Is it better? Uh, a little bit. Yeah, a little. Maybe just like when Kenzie and I are talking, maybe just mute yourself oh okay and then, yeah just when you're done talking. but you guys can hear me correct yeah yeah oh okay all right so like i i kind of just came in when you were talking to the last guy so like what are we what are we talking about uh these are the topics like, what would you, like to talk you disagree about? with oh uh i uh so great culture doesn't exist i, I don't know what that is actually like what is great culture as women perceive a continuum of threatened violence that ranges from sexual marks to sexual texting, touching to grief itself, it condones physical and emotional terrorism against women and presents it as a norm. Um, yeah, can but you, is that can a culture? Them. Ty, can you mute when you're not talking? Thank you. Uh, yes, that is a, an aspect of our culture. How is it an aspect of our culture if all of that stuff is illegal? Uh, sexual marks are not illegal. Well, and just, it's just, just because speech. something is illegal doesn't mean that it's not a part of culture. A culture has to be societally agreed upon. Like, you can't have stuff that's illegal to everybody be a part of a culture. Um, no, it does not have to be agreed upon. It's just... Uh, something that's present within a collective that's not all the way the case one second i don't know I, if you've ever taken any sort of like cultural studies class <laughs> you would definitely know that that's not the case but it has to be like legal. i'm i'm going to go to my computer and we're going to look up the definition of the word culture okay. one second how exciting I'm sure the definition will tell us the answers. I love how we wanted to appeal to authority. Yeah, that's that's really fun. 
Yeah, like there's even things like countercultures what? that are heavily spoken about that like are considered a culture, but they're not necessarily like some countercultures can be like buggy and like I don't know, like in even just like in the uh, in Canada, there's a province that used to have like I forget what they were called, um, but they would have like big celebrations in like downtown Vancouver where people would smoke weed and that was like when it was illegal but it was like a culture like they did it every single year in vancouver so i think it was gas town something like that but yeah definitely culture can be something that is not legal they can actually like they can make a culture out of it in an effort to make it legal like canada did how can something be something that it's against that doesn't make any sense it's a social institution Yeah, cultures don't have to like adhere to like what the laws are necessarily like as I, I mean, I just gave you an example the arts, of the culture, the arts or other manifestations of human intellectual achievement regarded collectively. The custom arts show social institutions and achievements of a particular nation, people or other social group. Right. So, yeah, I would say grave culture is a social institution within our social group. It, it's not, though. It's it, not, nobody it thinks that 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 grape is okay. Um, nobody that, thinks that that's okay. <laughs> they actually do. Um, like that's how gang rape gang grape exists. Is that that is a collective of people who think that grape is okay? And even if we look at that's, society, one second. Even if we look at how society responds to that, they typically empathize with accusers and uh, demonize victims or blame victims. Where do you see that at? Not saying that people don't blame victims, but like, where do you see that in in any type of aspect that would make it like the majority? Then you see that. If you see victim blaming, then you acknowledge that. But that's not, that's kind of rare. Like, Victim huh? blaming is not rare. Yeah. Also, just aside from the definition, in the, of in the in the way you're using the term, yes, it is. Um, so prosecutors mm-hmm. won't say it's too risky to charge a mugger because the jury will hear that she carried her purse in plain sight, but they will say it's too risky to charge a rapist because the victim was drunk, had a previous sexual encounter with them. Um, might have been re- wearing revealing cold clothing, so on and so forth. Okay, but that's like that's like a, a gray area of life. That's like something that people are unsure of. So you see how when it comes, which is to how the, crime uh, works. One second. It, but there is a unique perspective when it comes to grape that that perspective is not applied to other crimes. What other so crime don't you have to prove culture. without a shadow of a doubt that you did in order to be committed of it? Or That's in order not to be what they said. I just gave you the example that a prosecutor will not say it's too chargy, to, it's too risky to charge this person as as you carried your person in plain sight, where they will apply that logical process to someone who was a great. What, where are you seeing this happen? Um, I, I, first of all, I'm. Okay. I'm, I'm black, places, so if you want like an infamous uh, example, that would be Amber Heard and Johnny Depp. Uh, Johnny Depp was very much empathized with, and Amber Heard was very much villainized. I also say just because I took like a from my cultural studies. That's class, because she said on, a on, lot of stuff that weren't second, that wasn't true, and she also did yeah. stuff to the yeah. other person that makes the that yeah, makes it on. not. One second. I, I well, want to give like well, no, let me um, one, one second, Bell. Let me address that. So this specific case was heard in the UK as well as in the United States, and we had two different outcomes. The reason we had two different outcomes is the one in the UK was heard before a judge, and the uh, defense that Johnny Depp did is called Darvo, which is essentially uh, where you reverse the scenario and say I'm the actual victim, not that. That doesn't work on judges typically, but it works on juries. And that jury within the United States trial also was not sequestered. So they had access to social media and could very much be influenced by how social media portrayed Johnny Depp and Amber Heard. 
did any of the facts in the case change between the two instances? What they were allowed to say in court did change, um, yes. yes, there was. There was some evidence that was excluded in the U.S. trial that was included uh, in the um, U.K. trial. Um, I forget the assistant's name. I want to say it begins with a D, but there were some texts between Amber Heard and that assistant that were not allowed in the United States trial. Do you have any, like, proof of that or, like? Yeah, you can see that they were allowed in the U.K. trial because that's public record, and you can see that they were not allowed in the U.S. trial. Okay, well, I'd have to look that up. But that you do understand that that is a very, like, specific case, right? Like, you... You like, that's not. That's not how. No, 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 no. I said examples that would make this, like, a societal many, thing and not just an uh, isolated how incident. Like, how many do you want? How many do I need to give you? A fair amount. Like, you can't just say something is, like, an epidemic in our society and have, like, one or two examples. <laughs> sure. So let's talk about Harvey Weinstein. Brock Turner is a... Brock Turner is one of those cases where it was just like there is no reason he should have gotten away with what he did but we understand why people like that get away with what they do so brock turner is a great example uh, because i can guarantee you, you if Don't i can guarantee trump? you if i'm brock turner i wouldn't have gotten away with that donald trump also is a uh, is an exclusive case because he has a lot wait, of money and wait, a lot of pull against a lot of people like, wait are you saying that there's elements um forget no, correct I, me if i'm wrong well, one second, I haven't made my argument yet. Correct me if I'm wrong. Are you saying there's elements of white supremacy or racism within our culture? Sure. But that's illegal. What, what does that have to do with, but what does that have to do with great culture? It's not a culture thing. Well, it's just people who illegal. do that. It's it, a case it by case basis. Be, it is illegal. It's illegal? Yeah, it is illegal to have a bias or prejudice of someone based on the color of your skin. So how can you say that's a part of our culture if by your own framework, it's, something is not a part of culture if it's not, uh, if it's in our laws? No, I, I, you said it's in our, you said it's in our culture, like it's in our society. It's in there. It's not like a accepted part of it. I would say racism is not people accepted. once again once once again this is a case by case thing like not everybody if, if somebody was to be ousted as a racist most people would say that that person's a bad person like nobody like I don't get what you're trying to say because it's I in our society it's not a pivotal part of our society well let me let me explain so you made a claim that it's not a part of our culture because number one it's not accept uh, socially acceptable by people and number two it's illegal and yet you did make the claim that there is white supremacy and racist within our culture even though it meets those two same criteria where i would argue that most people would say racism is not acceptable and it is illegal so why do you recognize it in this one instance but ignore it in this other i don't ignore it at all i said it's a part of everything's a part of society you have a case-by-case -case basis based off of every individual in this society who knows there could be there could be i feel like now there could be cannibals in our society. i'm not being disingenuous yeah now because you're, you're you're lying you are um i'm not though you, what yeah, you are, because you you went specifically to look up the word culture to show that grape does not fit within that definition. But now you're saying that racism and white supremacy does, which, for the record, I agree with. No, you. I didn't but say that it fits in that. I didn't say that. I did not say that. I said it happens. Uh, the word culture says that it has to be an achievement regarded collectively. Not case by case, everyone has to agree with this. Or a majority of people have to agree with this. Yeah, not what? necessarily too. I've, I've taken a cultural studies class and I'll give you the definition. This is the literal okay. definition of culture. Hold on. There are multiple definitions to words. Usually words I just read you two of them. One second. Yeah, I'll, I'll give you one as well that's like from like an academic. 
um, shared meaning. But that, but see, no, 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 no. I don't, no, I don't no, want no, someone no. else's no, definition. I'm going to one hundred percent give Bell the space to speak. Stop. Shared meanings or shared conceptual conceptual maps. Those who interpret the world in roughly similar ways which allows us to build a shared culture of meanings and construct a social world which we inhabit together. And so shared meanings or shared conceptual maps like would absolutely fall under exactly what Kenzie is talking about. You provided like from the Oxford Dictionary, you provided both one and two on the definitions, meaning you provided two different definitions. So you acknowledge that there are more than one definition typically to words. When we are looking at cultural studies, the definition I provided is typically the one that is used. Uh, ma'am, but you do realize that that basically just says the same thing as the other two, right? That it, just it says really the same thing as the other two. It really doesn't. You just said like it has to be an art or something. No. No, I said the arts and other manifestations of human intellectual achievement regard it collectively. The customs, yeah, arts, you know social institute. That's that, what that you, definition right there is referring to like humanities and like literature and music. That's not the kind of definition of culture that we're working on. Uh, no, that's it's, culture like, in every regard. I that's in the no, second no. definition. It's not. If you look at the third definition, it literally says maintain in conditions suitable for growth. Are we like, can we use that definition too? Because that one's on the Oxford Dictionary. Like, no, words have multiple definitions, multiple ways in which we use them in society typically. Um, so this one definition, you can't use this one definition and say that this has to fit what Kenzie's talking about. Do you have a counter? Thing is messing up. Okay, I'm, yeah, and to be honest, like I feel like I'm One done second. with it anyway because I don't have a lot of respect for liars, and you clearly lied. So I don't think we can continue having this conversation. Too real. Too real. Yeah, I mean, like, yeah. I mean, literally, the def I could say the definition of culture is to maintain in conditions suitable for growth. That doesn't fit what you're saying, Kenzie. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that would just be a stupid argument. You can only talk about bacteria. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, that's not usually how we use words. I'm, I'm not running. I already told you, you lied, and I don't have respect for liars. So I don't Hello. think we can continue. Hello, welcome. Hi, do you mind if I ask a couple questions? Sure, go ahead. So, um, I'm confused about what feminists uh, believe. Do you think that women are better than men, or do you think we should just be equal? Um, I mean, if we're looking at the current social construct of man and woman, yeah, I would say women are better. But if we're looking how someone should experience uh, the world, uh, no, I, I don't think that anyone should experience the world uh, facing oppression, exploitation, or discrimination, especially on the basis of gender, but also on the you know basis of ability, ethnicity, nationality, race, age, so on and so forth. All right, yeah, I agree with that. Oh, I'm, I'm 14. Am I not allowed to be on here? Yeah. Oh. Your TikTok guideline, uh, terms of service, you have to be 18 to go on. 14? <laughs> I'm finishing three. Or seven. Or uh, nine. Yo, Hello, how old are you? I'm 20. Right, what year were you born? 2003. Perfect. What is your take? Uh, yeah, so my take is on body count. That body count 100% does matter. Why? Because number one, right, there's studies that I have here that prove that the higher someone's body count, the more likely they are to have a substance dependence, meaning that they're addicted to drugs or alcohol. Oh. I'm excited. Can you tell me the title of that source? 
Uh, let me just go to the top. Give me a second. It's yeah. called the relationship between multiple sex partners and anxiety, depression, and substance dependence. Multiple sex partners. And what? Oh, it just puts substance dependence and it should come up. And then uh, go to the graphs because that gives us the most the most clear reading. This is from February 2013? Uh, yeah, 2013, yeah. It's the National Library of Medicine. And then there's okay. like three more studies on the other effects. But you can just go to the graphs. It's easier to read. There's quite a bit inside this study. I'll be right back. So I think it is table three. Yeah, go to table three. Yeah, that's where it is. I'm reading. If you could be quiet. Uh, so if you look in paragraph two, of your introduction. It says, studies addressing this directionality of this association have mainly focused on mental health problems resulting in sexual risk taking. There is evidence from these studies that alcohol or substance use, as well as antisocial behavior in childhood and adolescent, adolescence, predicts risky sexual behavior. The few studies that have examined whether sexual risk taking results in mental health problems found early in sexually transmitted STIs associated with later depression problems. So this um, actually says that it is actually the alcohol or substance abuse and antisocial behavior that predicts the, the risky sexual behavior, not that risky sexual behavior results in these outcomes. Oh no, that's only one of the tables. So they did four different statistics in this one study. So the first, you're reading the second one. The next, the it one. even says in the next paragraph, less less is known about the psychological consequences of multiple partners. Yeah, I'm not talking about anxiety, depression. I'm talking about substance dependence. So keep reading. You will get to it eventually. Well, what that's what I gave you. What, what leads to substance dependency? Um, Multiple sex partners. Specifically in women. I would argue yeah, it's psychological like issues from multiple sex partners. Because it even says oh, that be, maybe because the relational aspect of sex is missing, the sex is impersonal, impersonable, and therefore may be negative emotional consequences. Okay, or it so may be due to emotional consequences of the breakups. I'm, I'm reading your source. No, no, this is not what I told you to go. Remember, I told you there's different statistics within this one study. So the place where I told you to go, where I'm, what I'm referencing, says the association between the number of sex partners and later substance dependence disorders for women and men are shown in Table 3. Then it goes on to prove why women are affected much, um, how can I say, much higher compared to men when they have more sexual partners. So you actually have to go to... It might mean. show a correlation, but it does not equal causation. Because the oh, no, causation, causation... One second, one second. Am I not allowed to respond? Oh, yeah. Or, I'm sorry, does it show the causation? Can you show me where? So it shows the causation because they did, how they did this study. Let me break down how they did the study. No, they, I want to see one, in the study. Once, I, I don't want you to explain it to me in your own words. I want to see within the study where it says we can show that this is causational. They don't use causation. They use really different words. They say due to the number of high sexual partners, Later, after the people engaged in the sexual activity, this is when they were diagnosed. So what this basically says in short is that after they accumulated the number of sexual partners, this is when they developed the substance disorder, which does prove a causation, not a correlation. So we just no, go to it just goes to the correlation it because it actually has to show the causation, which it explains in the body of the literature that it can be due to how the relationship was perceived, either that they weren't um, actually even having sex within the relationship um, or what they were in the relationship for was not being achieved, whether that's long term uh, stability, whether that is fidelity, stuff like that. It, it actually doesn't say 
that just having a lot of sexual partners relates to drinking. And I would actually have a no, counter statement that does. actually says the opposite. It definitely does say that if you go to table three, because you're not reading the protocol like, ra- Rather than you kind of misinterpreting the table, I would actually like you to for you to, to point to me where those so, words are. I'm trying to, but you're not going there. You're reading the introduction, so it's kind of useless. It, not right, so to it, uh, and you just keep going back to the table, going back to the table, going back to the table. Yeah, because that's what where I'm referencing. It, one second, one second. I want you to give me something else that says, because I just think you're misinterpreting the table, is my point. Give me something else that says within this source what you are saying. Okay, directly above the table is an entire paragraph that breaks it down. That's what I'm saying to go there so you can read it for yourself. Table three, you said? Oh, uh, yeah, table three. Okay. And go right above table three gives you figure one. That's the, the all the statistics. And then go the paragraph right above that one. And then you can read the, that paragraph. It breaks down the table. Predicted probability of substance dependence disorder from a logistical model, including reported number of partners, sex, and their interaction. Reported number of partners was used as a continuous vary and restricted to those partners with less than 50. The p-value shows the interaction term. It does not say what, what you're saying. I, I'm not sure you're at the right place. Does the paragraph start with the association between the number of partners? Is that what the paragraph starts with? It's directly um, well, you said the, so one. the association between reported number of sex partners and later substance dependence disorder yes, for women and men at 3H. Yeah, that doesn't say what you're saying. I keep reading it. It definitely does. As it you just said, says you were saying. Age periods. That, that's you, the end you of the were saying, So your first thing, your first premise, when you read the first, I think the second paragraph of the, of the introduction, you said that substance dependence leads to high sexual partners. So now I'm showing to you that that's not how the study works. The study shows that later substance dependence is caused. So your first claim is already wrong. It's, it's false. I'm and I can keep reading. Study. Yeah, yeah, but it's false because you have to read the entire study, not just the introduction. You get what I'm saying? So and then the I, second thing said, you specifically pointed to, and it's not saying what you're saying. No, I just disproved your first point where you said that sexual partners leads i mean that substance dependence leads to sexual partners which is not true as you can see in the study the second part if you keep reading until one two three four five i believe the fifth line where it says for men if you keep reading from there downwards then you will see that there is actually a causation because they did the study after the people had sexual partners not they did before and after so after the oh, i'm sorry what, the what section partners, are you referring to the the same paragraph so the you same, so paragraph it. two of the introduction. No, no, no. The table three above figure one, that paragraph. That also so shows wait, the Okay, one second. Table three, and I'm reading the what? association between number of partners, that paragraph. Just read the whole paragraph and then you'll understand. So it thing. says table three, the association between reported number of sexual partners and later substance dependence disorder for women and men at three age periods. That's all it says. Three latest substance dependence for women and men shown in table three. Where do you see age? Age periods? Oh, yeah, yeah, keep reading, keep reading. You just read, keep reading. And then it goes read into the, the table. Paragraph. There's, it can't just go into the table. There's, there's almost 20 lines to this paragraph. Yeah, no, table three. Go up. I read wait, what wait, you wait. told me to read, to read. Okay, so you see table three, go scroll up a little bit. Do you see figure one? Then go one, one up. That paragraph, yeah, right there, right there. Wait, wait, no, down, down, down. The paragraph, the paragraph, not the table. Right there, right there. Yes. Yeah, that's the way So it the is. association between, okay. So the yeah. association between number of partners and later substance dependence disorder for men and women are shown in table three. Because the analysis showed a, success, a significant interaction by gender, the results are separately shown for men and women. For women, there were statistically significant associations between the number of partners and substance dependence disorder at all periods, and the ratio increased with the increasing number of partners. For men, this was true ages 21 to 32, but not at age 26. Women reporting more than 2.5 partners per year had much greater odds of being diagnosed with a substance dependency disorder than those who were one or no partners at each age. Adjusted odds, 99%. The effect was stronger 
Although having multiple sexual partners was followed by substance dependence disorders for both genders, men were more likely than women to have a disorder when they had no or fewer sexual partners where women were approximate 10 partners in the same time period were much more likely to have the disorder than men. It still doesn't say it's the cause. Yeah, now you have to read on how they actually did the study. So okay, we so can what's read the next, thing, what's which is going to take next part quite some time. I'm going to summarize how it was done, right? Because it's in very simple terms as well. But well, we can't I, be no, reading I, I, every I, I don't want your analysis. I don't want your analysis. I want to you to point to me we, within the study. Debating. So we debating, right? So I'm going to no, summarize. I, my you can give your analysis after. You can give your analysis after. But I just want you to point to it. No, it wasn't an analysis. Like, if we read this entire study, it's going to take forever. So, of course, after the debate, well, like, that's you can why read That's I'm asking you to point to what you're specifically saying. I have to go read. Oh, wait, I have to find it again. Do you see how many paragraphs there? But basically, all, all they did, in short, is, like I said before, they asked them before they accumulated these amounts of sexual partners, and they diagnosed them with substance dependence. If they had any, they diagnosed them with mental disorders. And then they did the study or a questionnaire, I believe it was a questionnaire, after they accumulated on average 65, I think the range was 20 to 65 sexual partners. Then they did the study again. And after the people accumulated the sexual partners, this is when they developed substance disorder. So that, that can be seen as causation because obviously we cannot um, analyze everyone's life on a daily basis. So they just get a generalization. And this generalization does prove that this could be a causation. So, yeah. So body count in this regard does matter. And then I have a few other points that we can go over if you want to. That's of course if you accept the study as true, because you can obviously object the study. No, I don't think you've established causation. I think you're just saying it's the cause because again, you don't have it. I just told you, I just told you how the study was done. So like, Right, but again, it's not showing in the study that people have high, uh, people have substance abuse later on simply because of the multiple partners, not because of the outcomes of those interactions. So, no, again, the while I, one second, one second. While I do agree with you that you have established some correlation, you have not established any causation. Okay, so the reason that this can be seen as causation, I'm mistaken, is because let me see the paragraph that I gave you. Women reporting more than 2.5 partners. There we go. Women reporting more than 2.5 partners per year had much greater odds. Now, what does this mean? If the odds are higher, this can also be linked to a causation, not just correlation. Because no, correlation. If, they don't, no, if they don't have the sexual partners, then the odds are lower, meaning they don't have a substance disorder. But so if there they have is more correlation, partners, again, not causation. You can't say that no, that is the cause. The more all, sexual partners. All, all you are doing again is just reiterating that there is a correlation. You're not establishing a causation. Okay, so your whole thing is that you're only taking into account the actual how can I say the actual sexual intercourse, which we can't only do with sexual partners, because we have to also understand that people do have emotional connections to this to their sexual partners. So we can't just say, oh, okay. They have a lot of sex. Let's try and prove this. No, that's not how these studies are done. These studies are also done on a psychological level, which does take into account the emotions that they're feeling during the relationship. So if we had to take everything into account, which is what we should be doing to prove this, we can see that, yes, more sexual partners well, leads to why, substance Why dependence. is there a difference between men and women? Why is there a difference? In the, well, yeah. the studies why were there different outcomes when it came yeah. to reporting of... Par um, partners, why were there different outcomes to men and women if simply just having yeah. high body count creates the issue? Why were there different outcomes for men and women? No, because I didn't only say high body count. Remember, I just said emotional connection. So the reason that there was different outcomes is because this is also proven women are more emotionally reactive, meaning they react to emotion on a larger scale. There's also studies to prove this. And this study also confirms this. So that's the so reason. That it's not the high body count. It's not the high body no, count. Is. Because if one it second, because if you have the high body count and you don't have the negative emotional outcomes that it comes with, then you won't have the substance abuse. It's not the body count. It's the fact that their needs within the relationships were not met. 
consistently. No, the study, the study doesn't prove this, right? The study doesn't have anything to do with what you just said. So, yeah, the study doesn't have, what you just said doesn't relate to the study, like, at all. It, it even, no, you're just, you're misinterpreting the analysis, because even if you scroll down to discussion, the explanation for the relationship is likely to be complex. So it's already complex. So it's not just about the fact that you're engaging it. Four possibilities are proposed. First, sexual risk-taking and substance abuse may be a part of the cluster of risk-taking behaviors common in adolescents and young adults. For instance, people who are impulsive may be more likely to engage in both activities, which shows why there's a correlation, but one does not cause the other more likely to, and more likely to become substance dependent. Second, occasions of substance use are opportunities for sexual behavior because of its dis in, uh, inhibitory effects and lack of accurate perception risk. So people who do uh, participate in substance abuse are likely to get a higher body count because uh, it lowers their inhibition and their perception of um, analyzing risk. Thirdly, shared context uh, may be an important factor so much that young people are likely to meet new sexual partners in situations where alcohol is served. Um, fourth, intriguing possibility is that something about having multiple sex partners in itself, which puts people at risk for a substance disorder. For instance, it may be due to the impersonal nature of sexual relationships. So again, it's not the body count. It can be due to the impersonal nature, which I would argue that might be failed relationships creates anxiety about initiating new relationships. So self-medication with substance, maybe one day with dealing with interpersonal anxiety. So no, your own study does not support your cause. Okay, well, you saying that we should ignore the rest of the factors, right? So you're saying, okay, number one, you said you want to basic solely on sexual interactions. But these relationships, this is done on sexual partners. So they're not just saying, oh, okay, the sex causes it. No, we have to take into account that the people were emotionally committed to the relationship. And yes, that could have been the reason that they created substance dependence. But according to the study, that's not how they're doing this, right? They, they um, take in it, everything. It is. Into it is actually like they laid out four possible outcomes. And it's not the body count yeah. itself. It is the interpersonal nature of the relationship. So no, it's not the body count itself. It is the socialization and the psychological well-being of it, which, which I agree. I agree. I think that people who engage in sexu uh, sexual hypersexualization can be a result of trauma, can be due to alcoholism or substance abuse. Um, I don't disagree with that. I'm just saying, like, for example, but it's not the body count itself. It's other underlying issues, which your study agrees with me. Mm, yeah, it course. also talks about the, the loneliness whole... and helplessness that are related to substance abuse. So, yeah, if someone has multiple partners and these multiple partners don't work out and they feel lonely and hopeless, that makes sense why they would then turn to substance abuse. Yes, I agree with you on that point, right? Obviously, <laughs> the other things that happen in the relationship are the reasons. But the whole idea of a high body count, right? We have to also understand, realistically, when you have a high body count, you are emotionally committed to those relationships. So we should absolutely take that into account. And this well, can further... Um, I have married friends who are swingers. So they are in a long-term committed relationship and they still engage with multiple sex partners. Um, and even the paragraph below, also says, perhaps surprisingly, in the view of the earlier cross-sectional relationship, there is no clear association with multiple sex partners and subsequent anxiety or depressive disorders. Consistent with this null finding, a review of studies found that negative states, including depression and, and anxiety, were unrelated to sexual risk-taking. Sexual risk-taking. Yeah, so the yeah. thing that you just said, swingers, right, where they have in a committed relationship and they still have multiple sexual partners. Well, the reason that they wouldn't want the study, number one, is because the emotional needs are being met on a regular basis because they're in a committed relationship, right? Now, when they have in other sexual partners, I don't believe there's any studies done to prove that they aren't affected. Are there any studies done well, to prove that I they are never you, affected? I, right, but, but I just gave you an example to where emotional needs are being met, and you agree, uh, which still engaging and racking up a body count does not mean that it would lead to that subsequent uh, disorder because that that's my whole premise is that even what your your source agrees with me with is that it's not actually the body count it is the psychological as well as the emotional 
outcomes of those relationships. If you are having multiple relationships that fail, when you want them to be successful, that makes sense why you can be uh, feel lonely or hopelessness, why you might be um, hesitant to continue to engage in that behavior, and why self-medication and substance may be one of the ways of dealing with that. It's not the body count, it's the outcomes of the relationships. So would you say on average, right, people who engage in these sexual relationships are not emotionally attached to the people? Is that what you're saying? Um, that lead to the substance behavior. So if they do um, get the desired outcomes, uh, then no, I don't think you've established any causation of still them engaging in uh, substance abuse or alcoholism. Mm, so would you say that people on average, when they have sexual partners, they do not get emotionally attached? That's the whole question. So uh, no, would, I, I wouldn't make an sex? overarching statement like that. I wouldn't make an overarching statement like that. I'm saying it's a case by case basis. Sure, I, I do think okay, there are so, some people who do not get emotionally attached, and I think there are a lot of people who do get emotionally attached. I think it would also depend on frequency. If this is a one night stand, I would say it's unlikely that person would become attached. But if it's consistent sex over time, I would say the more and more likely you are to become like emotionally dependent or attached. More emotionally dependent and attached? Mm, I mean, one night stands, there are cases where people do get emotionally attached on one night stands, so I wouldn't really agree with that point. But uh, yeah, but then again, Which we still have to again, and like if you look at the sex difference paragraph, paragraph it says um, why essentially women had more negative outcomes than men. And it is because women typically want relationships for men now. Yeah, because they're more emotionally reactive and they have more expectations, yeah, of course. So yeah, we do have to take into account that they are emotionally attached. I would say body more point, reactive, but... Well, no, there's proof, that, yeah, there's studies that also prove they're emotionally reactive. They're also more emotionally attached. I think it depends on the emotion. I think men are more uh, emotionally reactive when it comes to anger. They get angry a lot easier than women. And they get a lot more violent in terms of like physical force. But no, oh, I, like I agree that. with everything your study says. It's just, it doesn't have anything mm. to do with body count. But the body count is the sex partners, right? Because they have relationships with these people. Um, no, it's not the body count. It's the outcome of the relationships. Yeah, but they linked. They they go together, right? Because there's sexual relationships. They, they do not. They do not. Um, no, again, someone, one, one more second. I, I'm going to explain this one more time and then we're going to move on. So if someone wants to be in a long-term committed relationship and they are having sex within these short-term relationships and these short-term relationships are not working out then yes they are going to be increasing sexual partners and because it's not working out can lead to the loneliness and hopelessness which can lead to the substance abuse but um also again someone who's exhibiting this same behavior if it does work out eventually then i would argue that they wouldn't be have the substance abuse even if you would consider they racked up a somewhat high body count within that time and then again someone being in a long-term committed relationship and either being polyamorous um not you know having an open relationship being swingers uh we would see different results as well so it's not just the act of engaging with multiple people it is the outcome and how it's aligned with your desires um because i think there, let me, let me find it. Um, there's another article that actually references this specific study and oh, says that me, yeah let me um i want to say it was in psychology today because this isn't the first time i've been given this study um Give me one second while I look it up. But what, what was your next? Yeah, no worries. Is there anything else you want to do on body count? Oh, yeah, with body count. Yeah, there's a few points on it. Um, That was just the first one, but we're going to have to still meet because you know, we have different views on that last point that you made. But anyways, the next point that we can look at is that it leads to, is this only for women? Yeah, only for women. It leads to higher rates of infertility. And the average is about 5.3 times more chance of infertility. Okay, yeah, so I mean, high body count leads to infertility. Gotcha. What's uh, what's that study? Uh, it's just, the name of the study is called 
Did, uh, let me see. Let me just go to the top. Wow, this thing is long. Determinants of infertility among married women. Yeah, just search those keywords and then it should come up. Determinants of infertility among married mm. women? Yeah, that's the, yeah. It's a lot longer, but just search that, it should come up. And that's from also PubMed? I think it's also, yeah, yeah, National Library. Same one. Okay. Okay. And where are we looking? I am at 3.6 determinants of women's infertility. Okay. It's table two, just above table two. You found it? Yep. Okay. Um, do you see the, let me see. It says the odds of infertility among women. Do you see those words? It's the first line, second paragraph. The odds. Uh, infertility among women who whose age at the first pregnancy is less than 21 oh uh, yeah and then it, yeah okay. just keep going from the okay the odds of infertility among women who at their at the first stage of pregnancy is less than 21 years were 2.9 times higher than among those who were at the age of their first pregnancy is greater than or equal to 21 yeah so basically it's saying that let me see. Let me just double check to make sure I'm saying the right thing. So it's Is saying that your age determines your odds of infertility, mm -hmm. that you, your first pregnancy is less than 21. You're two times higher than women who are older. No, this is just the first point. I just want to make sure that you familiar right. with everything. <laughs> right. So, so are you uh, well, making the argument that women shouldn't get pregnant before 21? Oh no, I'm saying that women with higher body counts suffer from infertility. If you keep reading, it says women who had multiple sexual partners had 5.3 times more chance of infertility. Like, keep reading the paragraph. Why, why is that? Infertility, let me see, women had history of STI were 2 to 0.8 times more infertile. They take into account all, all regards, right? So they take into STIs, they take into right. substance abuse again, take into a whole lot, yeah, take a whole lot of things into account. Right, so it's not the body count. It's, again, the specific if you had an STI, um, your age, your first menstruation, um, how many days? Wow. Yeah, there's quite a few things in the study. It's also quite a long study. I didn't read the whole thing. And then let me see what else there is. Since 21 years old. Menarche greater than or equal to 14 times. Oh, very little bleeding. Oh yeah, so it, it later on in the study also says it describes how it affects the menstruation flow and that can also lead to infertility. It describes how it can affect the hormone levels, hormonal disorders, and another one is absence of menstruation. And this is all caused by actively engaging in sexual intercourse with multiple sexual partners. So it's not where, only where the STIs. Wait, where are you reading that? Uh, go to discussion. And then another, another significant... Oh, here's another one. It's paragraph one. Another two, significant three, four, determinant four, menstrual flow, the odds of infertility. Yeah, that's another one. And then it, it doesn't the, say the, the it doesn't say that that is due to multiple partners. It said it's related to hormonal disorders. Yeah, the, the hormonal disorders come from high sexual partners. Where does it say that? That's, that's what the whole study is based on. No. What, where does it say that then? Oh, let me get the paragraph again. Hold on, I just have to skim through it and find it again. Okay, and I just want to let you know I have like three minutes left and then I have to end the live. You have three minutes? Oh, no worries. Oh, uh, just go to two two point three, and then just read that again. Two, I'm still finding the other paragraph. Three. Yeah, but you can just read that, and then the thing you just asked me to find, I'm still looking for it. 
I read it in the study. I'm just not sure what line it was. It was like in the middle of a paragraph, but I'll find it. Just read 2.3 in the meantime. Uh, the women who failed to achieve a clinical pregnancy for 12 months or more with regular unprotected sexual intercourse and married slash cohabited women ages 15 to 49 who are first on postnatal care at the time of the data collection were included. It's just saying what women were included. It doesn't say anything about high sexual partners. Oh yeah, what I'm saying that is- they're actually these married were... or cohabitating and that the partners, male partners who are infertile were excluded. Yeah, so it's regular sexual, regular unprotected sexual intercourse. So that's where I got right. the- Right, so if you're, if you're pregnant. trying to get pregnant, one second, if you're trying to get pregnant, Shouldn't you be having regular, unprotected sexual intercourse? If you, wait, can you repeat? You broke off for a second. If you, if you are trying to get pregnant, mm. shouldn't you be having regular, unprotected sexual intercourse? Yeah, of course. Great. So that's what this is saying. It mentions nothing about it being with multiple partners. It actually says it's between married and cohabitating women. Mm, yeah, yeah, I agree. Yes, this is just the eligibility criteria. So it's basically saying all the people who include in the study. So that's one of the criteria that they met. And then the other criteria is what I'm trying to find you about multiple right. sexual. It's not, it didn't, it's it's, <laughs> right. So, so yeah. this has nothing to do with with women who are having high body counts. This is just saying that these were women who were also trying to get pregnant within 12 months and having unprotected sex with their partner, which makes sense. Well, like, if you're trying to get pregnant. Thing. Don't have on, you know, have unprotected sex with your partner. That's... Yeah, of course. No, I'm, I'm showing you that. Um, how can I, I, say? I, I do what apologize. You know I do have to go. If you want to, uh, uh, like, DM me the specific uh, points of the article, I'd be happy to make a video on it. Um. Okay, yeah, I can okay. try and find them and I'll give them to you. Great. I appreciate it. Thanks for coming on. And I do want to say I really appreciate you actually coming with some type of sources. Um. You know, I, I will admit that some of the best sources I get for my talking for my arguments are from from people who oppose me. So uh, I've actually been given the first one that you gave me, but this one might be good, too. Uh, I'll have to read it further. So, uh, yeah, thank you, everyone who uh, joined, who followed, who liked. Um, I don't think we any who gifted. Um, I appreciate all of you. And oh, let's uh, I, I am actually. Thank you, Michaela. I am actually um, ending when I wanted to end, so we can do an, an outro properly. Um, so yes, you can also find me on the social media apps. I highly recommend you join the Discord. If you want to support me and my content monetarily, Venmo Cash App and buy as well as my Amazon book list. And then finally, let's do a raid. Oh, Jones. Thank you for the corgi. Um, Jones should be on my background. Always really awkward. I'm so fucking cute, bitch. I'm so fucking cute.